Well, again, thanks for, for the invitation, Stephen, and great to see everyone. I'm going to go through a bunch of bullet points um, for the sake of uh, for time, and I'm going to provide you with a sort of, uh, to the best of my ability, the sort of macro view from Tehran's perspective in terms of what is happening in Yemen or what has happened over the course of the last uh, decade. Um, let me start off with the obvious. In 2015, you know, uh, most of us Iran watchers, I think, were, uh, you know, uh, in agreement that Iran's involvement in Yemen was a card against the, um, the Saudis to bleed it, but to also play that Yemen card at the right moment as part of a political negotiation. And it was seen then, and I think it's seen to this day uh, largely the same way, uh, to play that card in the context, not just in terms of Iran-Saudi relations, but perhaps also in terms of how Iran can play the Yemen card to bring an end to its um, you know, position or pariah status, if you will, in, in Middle Eastern affairs. I hear what Jerry just said, Iran's involvement um, did not start in 2015, as Jerry just laid out. Uh, but as I also laid out in my uh, in my chapter uh, in the book that uh, uh, we're all here to sort of uh, talk about and promote, hopefully, uh, throughout the 1990s and the, uh, most of the 2000s, Iran took uh, what I would describe small steps in terms of being involved in Yemen. Uh, I, I don't really see any evidence to suggest that Iran's involvement in Yemen is some uh, you know, major strategic uh, blueprint that was devised or conceived of at some point in Iran and has been implemented ever since. I think events that have shaped Iranian policy much more than any ideological group, blueprint that one might be able to uh, point to. Again, as Jerry pointed out, Yemen is simply too far away from, from Iranian perspective, too complicated. And to begin with, at least, with very few uh, openings for the Iranians to move in uh, with and sort of uh, try and, and gain a foothold. Um, but six years of war has changed a lot of that. I think clearly, uh, if you're sitting in Tehran, you, you believe now that the Houthis have performed much better than Tehran anticipated back in 2015, and the Saudis and allies have uh, fallen short. Uh, and I think that would be understatement in terms of military achievements. Um, the growing Houthi military muscle uh, clearly is something that reflects an Iranian desire to invest in this Houthi military uh, capability. How much uh, in terms of uh, uh, Iran's involvement in helping the Houthis militarily versus what the Houthis have done themselves or from other sources, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but some of the source, some of the data that the Saudis are putting out there, you know, 800 drone and missile attacks over the course of this war, you know, if that is true, and I have no idea of, of, of knowing whether this figure of 800 of drone and missile attacks is true, but it is true, then, you know, clearly uh, those point to Iranian military strengths, the drone and miss ballistic missile uh, capabilities. Um, uh, so in other words, I think the, the, the Houthis um, uh, became over the course of the last five or six years gradually more worthy as, a, as a, uh, a partner, as an entity to invest in. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the regional rivalry with the Saudis and the United States uh, was a key factor in this. The coming of the Trump administration and the arrival of King Salman and his son, Mohammed bin Salman, um, uh, you know, uh, clearly uh, required the, for, for the Iranians to rethink perhaps the, the way they looked at their involvement in Yemen. Uh, less so as a sort of a card to play when the uh, opportune moment presented itself, but more as a long-term commitment uh, because of what they predicted to be a long-term tensions with, with Riyadh under the new leadership that came uh, following King Abdullah. Um, at this point in the Yemen conflict, I think the Iranians have come to the conclusion that the Saudis have lost uh, and that Yemen is now a card, as I said, a, a bargaining chip for Iran to, to be able to play. I suspect they want to play it in a regional format uh, and, and not in a bilateral format with the Saudis, if for no other reason, the fact that the Saudis are not ready at this point to talk to the Iranian bilaterally. Um, the fact that the Iranians want to sort of elevate their public uh, role in the Yemeni conflict and their ability in clout in that country, I think was best res reflected by the October uh, 2020 decision to send uh, Ambassador Hassan Irlu um, to uh, Yemen uh, after five years of Iran not having had an ambassador. 
the timing to me suggested that they felt that you know something major was about to happen and Iran wanted to be much more uh, you know open explicit about what uh, it it had to offer uh, as a as a uh, peacemaker or a power broker whatever term you want to use um, but the, the fact that it took him a year uh, to send an ambassador to uh, Yemen after the Houthis had uh, sent their ambassador to to Tehran to me at least suggested it, that the Iranians were still caution uh, cautious at this point and as a side note, let me just point out, and everyone on this call knows this, but Hassan Irlu, the new ambassador, is clearly a man from the Revolutionary Guards. And that shows you who runs Iran's Yemen uh, uh, policy in, in, in uh, uh, you know, as they do in Iraq and Syria. So this is not Javad Zarif's foreign ministry, people who are in charge of this file. This is clearly the Revolutionary Guards uh, file that is being maintained by them. Uh, but to suggest that this is, a, because I want to touch on the issue of factional politics, to suggest that Yemen is just the darling of the Revolutionary Guards and nobody else in Tehran cares about it, I think is also an, uh, a mistaken belief. Um, I think clearly, um, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei himself is, is, has in the recent years moved in the direction of being overtly in support of what Iran is doing in Yemen. I mean, as the Supreme Leader, he sets the tone. Um, and I think close advisors of Ayatollah Khamenei, people like Ali Akbar Velayati, who is a pretty powerful, if not one of the most powerful voices on foreign policy in the Supreme Leader's office. He is handling, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, much of Iran's Yemen uh, affairs. So to, to quickly wrap up here uh, for this uh, uh, part, I see Yemen's uh, role, uh, I'm sorry, Iran's role in Yemen in three phases since 2014. I see a opening where there's a deny uh, denying of any involvement. And then I see the Iranians being silent about charges that are being leveled against them to the present day where the Iranians are openly boasting about being supported, supporters of the Houthis and an entity that needs to be uh, on board for any political solution to happen as far as the Yemen conflict in, is concerned. And Stephen, let me just spend a minute or two on uh, some, some points that might be of interest for our conversation which is about the, the sort of broader geopolitics of, of, of this uh, Iranian um, involvement in Yemen. It used to be uh, that Iran looked at Yemen as a conflict between Iran and the Saudis, the United States and the United Arab Emirates. As we know, the UAE is more or less out of it. Uh, they chose to get out of it. Uh, and the Iranians don't really pressure the UAE over the Yemen issue any longer. If there is pressure on UAE, it's over UAE's relations with Israel, not so much what, what they're doing in Yemen. Uh, the Iranians believe that the, obviously the Saudis and the Americans want to get out of the Yemen war or, or bring it to an end. Um, and there's no sign as far as I can see to suggest that Iran would not want to be, uh, look for opportunities to bring that about and make itself a stakeholder in that decision-making process. Um, so if that makes sense. So the Iranians do welcome it and perhaps if they can find a mutually advantageous way of doing it, want to be part of that process. Um, the, the new actor, which I am interesting, uh, interested in following, and I think you know, it represents something new, is the involvement of new actors, particularly the Turks. The arrival of Turkey, which the Iranians, from what I can tell, seem to see as being linked to the cooling of relations between Washington and Riyadh, uh, represents a new set of challenges for the Iranians, because they have a bigger regional kind of uh, uh, rivalry with the Turks. And I am following this uh, Iranian uh, uh, fears about what Turkey wants to do in Yemen with, with interest. And I think it is interesting uh, because it brings up the whole issue of what would keep the Turks and the Saudis together in Yemen. And I guess if you're sitting in Tehran, one, one way of looking at it is yes, that the Saudis need military help, they need drones or whatever it is for their military operations since the Americans are reducing their commitment to the Saudi war effort. But I think, if, again, if you're sitting in Tehran, the fear might be that what brings the Saudis and the Turks together is something like supporting Islam and the Muslim brothers. And this is a direction, if things went in a direction, that would be unwelcome from Tehran's perspective. I, I don't think they want to see that, Turkey making inroads in Yemen on the back of uh, uh, supporting the Muslim brothers. But at the same time, it might present opportunities elsewhere in, a, in this sort of geopolitical competition. For example, the Emiratis would not want to see this. The Emiratis are against any political Islam in the region. And 
that would uh, you know provide Iran with an opportunity to perhaps work with the with the UAE uh, um, in the, in the case of of Yemen. Um, I, I, I've spoken more than I should. Final words, uh, I, and I'll stop, Stephen. Give me one minute. Um, as I said to begin with, much in in Iran's Yemen policy has really been about circumstances. You know how how things have shaped Iran's decision. How the Saudis failed militarily it gave Iran an opportunity, and I think to to a large extent that is still very much true. Uh, circumstances are very much deciding Iran's next steps. Uh, but one thing that we need to ask ourselves uh, going forward is. Uh, Yemen no longer is just a card for, for the Iranians to play, or is it? I mean, that's a question mark for, that I have here for me. Um, but one of the fears we should have, certainly here in Washington, is that if the Iranians decide that it's no longer just a tactical card to play, that Yemen is worthy as a long-term investment, regardless of what happens with Saudi Arabia, that other regional threats from Tehran's perspective, particularly the Israelis in the Red Sea, gives Iran reason to want to stay committed uh, to its Yemen project. And I'll stop there, Stephen. 